Good morning, dear saints, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Today's Tuesday, August 20th, and each weekday morning, we all gather around the Holy Scriptures to which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Today, we are wrapping up our book uh, on Thessalonians, Paul's letter to the saints in Thessalonica. St. Paul is offering final instructions and encouragement to these believers. He asks for their prayers that the Lord's message may spread rapidly and they would be delivered from wicked and evil people. Paul reassures them of the Lord's faithfulness, urging them to remain steadfast and obedient. But then he also addresses the issue of idleness among some of the members, reminding them that those who are unwilling to work should not eat and encouraging the community to avoid associating with such individuals, but while still treating them as brothers. That's going to be interesting, and I can't wait to get into it. But first, I want to let you know that support for Thy Strong Word comes from the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. You hear me talk about them all the time, but with over 145 languages covered by their resources and more than 5.8 million books distributed, much of that free of charge. LHF is making sure that the essential Christian resources are available to help individuals grow in faith no matter where they are in the world. If you want their help in your outreach mission or you'd like to be a part of theirs, discover how at lhfmissions.org. From me, I want to thank you for joining us this morning as we study the Bible. I want to remind you that if anything that we talk about today sparks a question or a thought or a disagreement, you know what? That's okay. I'd love to hear from you. And if you uh, email me while we're on the air, I can probably get your question or your comment out on the air. You can reach me by, by email at thystrongword at kfuo.org. I'm also on X and Facebook if that's your thing. All right, let's get right to it. Our guest returning contributor to the show, always great to have him on, the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Good morning, brother. Welcome back. Yeah, excited to, uh, we're, we're wrapping up a book. It's always uh, kind of an honored place to be at the beginning or at the end, you know? So uh, yeah. yeah, we'd like to to be able to talk about uh, this and, and give us hope in the midst of our expectation of Christ, his uh, promise to return, um, but our call to be diligent in the time that uh, God has given us now. So there's much work to be done and <laughs> there's a lot to do. Yeah, you know, and uh, we're going to have a little bit more work to do than we would have uh, planned for. Uh, just to kind of be out there, full transparency, I, I had planned on um, having uh, Tom Eckstein on, Pastor Eckstein, tomorrow to discuss three verses. That was over. That was an oversight by me. When I split it up, I gave him the last three verses of the book to cover for an hour. I, I, that's not fair to him, even though I bet he could pull it off and it would be fascinating. Uh, but uh, we're going to go ahead and finish up the book today. So that means we get kind of a surprise topic tomorrow. Pastor Eckstein and I will go into something uh, just ad hoc, but I just want to let people know we're going to wrap up Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians today. All right, brother, start us off with a prayer and, and we'll, get, uh, we'll get to work. Yeah, let's, uh, let us pray. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your word is comfort and it reassures us, O oh Lord. So draw us again, once again, to your holy word that we may be comforted, uplifted, and kept. There are many things that could cause us to become um, hopeless and discouraged in this life. But help us, O oh Lord, to remain steadfast, following your son Jesus, following the example that he has set also through the apostles. Help us to walk diligently and encourage and uplift one another as we look forward to that day when Jesus, your son, comes and we will be raised from our graves to be with you forevermore. So keep us, O Lord, in this faith and guide and direct all of our callings in your name and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's head to our text. So we are in chapter 3 of Second Thessalonians. And I'm going to read uh, the first five verses, right? That'll give us plenty to chew on. Uh, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Finally, brethren, pray for us 
that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. All right, that's the end of verse 5. So, yeah, I, I, he's, loving, he's ending this letter with uh, pray for us, right? Uh, and pray for us because we want people to hear the word of Lord, honor it, just like the Thessalonians did. You know, I, when we look out into the world today, brother, you know, sometimes I fall into this trap, and I think we all do, of looking at them, especially those who might be very antagonistic against the faith in the church, because he says right here that there are some who won't believe. But still, I want to see them in heaven, and, 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 and I, that's, that's God's will for them. And so sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we are to conform ourselves to God's will, not fall into the trap of making enemies out of people. I, I see that was what he's saying here. He's he's warning them that they will meet wicked, evil men. But do you think Paul is saying that they're permanently wicked and evil, and therefore just don't don't worry about them? I mean, I don't know. What what do we make of this? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point, and draws many things of our section together um, because we're called to follow the example of Paul who was walking in the example of Christ. So what example can we find of Christ? And it's not that long. If you're, if you're, if your church is a three-year lectionary church, we've been now about five weeks talking about bread of life things and, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 started the whole discussion, just kind of finishing up John chapter six, last three weeks. So when Jesus, um, took his disciples who were um, had gone off and had preached and taught and had healed. When they had returned, they were exhausted. Jesus knew of their exhaustion. They couldn't even eat um, the, the amount of people that uh, they were caring for and all the things that they had uh, done. So he takes them off by themselves, uh, but the people saw, saw them go. They noticed the boat as it went. They followed them on land. And so when Jesus stepped out of the boat, there was a whole crowd, and it's there that Jesus, um, the text tells us that Jesus saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He didn't see them as enemies. I mean, there are times where the scriptures talk about that, um, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe we should allow the the context of that group that we're dealing with, the, the situation at hand, um, how they are uh, speaking and, and what they are saying to reflect how we should relate and what we should do. Because then that is also coming up in this chapter too. How should we relate to someone who is not taking sound teaching? After receiving right. sound teaching, are they, um, are they following along or are they going their own way? Are they following uh, themselves instead of following Christ? So depending on the situation, um, Christ has a different answer. He's got a different answer to the Pharisees. He's got a different answer to the Sadducees um, and to Herod than he does to the crowd that is like um, sheep without a shepherd. And so we can have compassion um, on this fallen world uh, that they too are like sheep without a shepherd. What does that look like? Well, it looks like they're going to be all over the place. <laughs> the sheep are going to be walking mm -hmm. all over the place and, and be a little lost. And we should expect them to be lost. Uh, but that's why they need the one true good shepherd. So, yeah, I think you're right. I, I'm saying all this in, a, in agreement with you that mm -hmm. we should turn with compassion to those uh, who, who need Christ. And maybe a different right. answer to those who have heard Christ and now are deciding to walk, walk away. Yeah, and I do believe that once we get to that section, that's going to be probably our primary focus. But just here at the beginning, you know, Paul's saying, I want a rapid and uh, successful spread of the gospel. Uh, but then this deliverance from unreasonable or wicked and evil men who oppose the gospel. So I, I think it's a reminder, too, that there is such a thing as spiritual opposition. There are people who... Uh, will set themselves up against the gospel. But it's interesting to me because as I think about this, and I think about like even the terminology of, you know, enemy, um, does an enemy, if someone makes themselves your enemy, 
I don't think you have to go to the fight. I don't think you have to join in. <laughs> I, I mean, you don't have to fight every fight you're invited to. And, and so if someone makes you your enemy, you can say, well, you set yourself up as my enemy, but for what it's worth, I'm not your enemy. And, and so this isn't about yeah. being soft on wickedness in the world. And it isn't about thinking that, well, we just can be nice and we can nice people into the gospel. I, I'm not saying that. I mean, sometimes it's necessary to to stand strong and stand firm and and absolutely resist those who would uh, uh, blaspheme and 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 draw people away. The Bible speaks very clearly about that. But you know, Paul's saying, "I want the word to go out. I want it to run and be glorified." Um, and the Thessalonians are an example. He's been praising them through the both books, both letters that he sent them. But they were once people who would, could be considered enemies of God, like we all were. So I just think that's worth keeping in mind. Yeah, I think that's a great point, you know, and especially taking the context. Take a look at, you know, if people want to, to read more and, and see the context. It's Acts 17 is um, the missionary journey, and in, which includes Thessalonica. And uh, you'll hear about Jason and all the things that are happening and how they go on from there. Um but there is an opposition, but there is also the mission, the opposition by those who had, you know, th for three uh, Sabbath days heard the message and many had started to believe. But then out of jealousy, there was an outrage, a stir that was brought up. Um, and your words here uh, also remind me of maybe some wisdom we can bring into our day. I know there are times in which I have to remind people they'll They'll seek uh, me out as a pastor when there's a conflict within the church. We also have a school, so church or school or their lives, and and it's one family against another family or this mm -hmm. program and situation and desire against another program and desire. And they'll look at me and like, what side are you on? <laughs> and I'll be like, no, no. Right. Like, that's the wrong question to begin with. You know, and and uh, finding encouragement from from Jesus Himself in in uh, the book of Joshua when He comes and Joshua asks Him, you know, uh, whose side are you going to be fighting on? And He goes, No, <laughs> you're asking the wrong question. Are you, the question is, are in our actions and what we're doing here, are we on the Lord's side? And when we're in division against each other in the church, we're not on His side. So let's let's uh, maybe stop sitting on opposite sides of the table, deal with the situation in brotherly love. Uh, and so when we have these times of wanting to see each other as enemies, you're reminded that we're actually brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, on that point, you know, it's it's fascinating to me as, as a Christian, um, a Lutheran Christian who lives right now in the Midwest. I have an amazing congregation our community. Uh, you can't swing a stick without hitting a church. You know, you throw a rock, it's probably going to hit a Christian of some sort. Um, and this was the same way growing up, growing up down south. You know, you'd be pumping gas and the, your, the guy pumping next to you would ask you if you know Jesus. Everybody was uh, very, <laughs> uh, very uh, faithful, at least, um, you know, in their various ways. We could all argue at the end of the day, but, you know, people had faith in the Lord and it was it was visible. But then you go out into the world, especially today, as Christianity loses favor and you go into places that perhaps is not strongly Christian or doesn't have that background. And it's not that you're running into people who are just these awful, evil, wicked people, but you quickly realize, yeah, these people don't have faith. Um, and, and so Paul says to them, and it's much more true back then, for not all have faith, but when he when he had says that, he immediately reminds them, though, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you. Against whom? Not the people who don't have faith, but the evil one. The people who don't have faith are the ones to whom we should be going. Uh, oftentimes, we don't need to guard ourselves against people who don't have faith. We should actually be there with them and, and encouraging them. But... That isn't to that isn't of course to say that it isn't dangerous being a Christian. Um, speaking uh, broadly and and thinking about Christians around the world and throughout history, yeah, it's not ever really been favored in the world, and that's something that the Thessalonians knew very well that we as American Christians have forgotten. 
Yeah, and and we're dealing with here. Um, it kind of makes it really clear. Uh, the Lord is faithful and will establish you and guard you against the evil one. I mean that that connects our chapter to last week's chapter. Um, they were struggling with their thoughts about the end times. Um, you know, does does their thoughts that Christ is coming lead them to um, a disorderly life in which we'll deal with in this text or complete hopelessness that somehow they've missed out. Now that's going back to the the book before the first letter that they had mm-hmm. somehow missed out on Christ and missed out on his return. Um, so when Paul is writing this letter and encouraging them here, uh, it, it is very missional. You know, he came to them, he established a church, and then he was kicked out of town pretty quickly. <laughs> and now right. he's having to write back and encourage, uplift, and teach them. Um, yeah, so when you say, you know, growing up, you, everybody at school, you, I went to a public school, but everybody at school had their own churches, and we all went to church on Sundays, and maybe not all, but um, they, at least they would say they had a church they could have attended um, <laughs> right. if they were doing something else, the same kind <laughs> of struggles. Um, but um, today in in our church, we're baptizing more and more adults. We are um, through the school and, and preschool, There, there's way more people um, who just simply don't know Jesus. Maybe they've heard of the name and heard the name of Christian, but they don't know him. So, um, yeah, we just have to be more uh, open to the fact that people are just simply, it's not that they're openly opposed. And I we, I guess maybe we know biblically there is a um, a theological point that, yes, when we don't know Christ, we are opposed to him. Right. But we are enemies it, of God, right? Yes, Born that way. Yeah. Right. But there is this ignorance where they just simply don't know. They, it's not like they've heard the gospel and then are like, oh, I don't want anything to do with it. They simply don't know the gospel. And so it's like the first time coming into Thessalonica instead of being run out of Thessalonica. So, yeah, I think we need to to be ready to um, to preach the gospel and to, to know that people maybe are going to look different and they're going to look a certain way before coming to church and, and all the rest and inviting them to church. Um, and uh, just simply because they don't know Christ. <laughs> they, they don't know anything about the life that we've been, we've been called out of darkness, but right now they're standing in it, so... Yeah, we shouldn't assume that just because people have heard of Jesus and know something about Christianity that they've actually heard the true gospel. I want to do a little aside here, though, based on your comments about going to school and, uh, you know, there's Christians, uh, all the kids, you know, they they know of a church that they could go to if they wanted to. That sparked in my mind when I was in Connecticut. I, um, believe it or not, sort of for fun, uh, decided I would volunteer to be a substitute teacher in the public schools. So on Fridays on my day off, occasionally I'd be called in to be a public uh, uh, school uh, sub. And so anyway, I was talking to the kids and, you know, I tell everybody I'm a pastor and, you know, most of them, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one kid comes up to me and and she says, yeah, yeah, I go to church. Uh, and I'm like, oh, wow, where do you go to church? And she names my church. <laughs> and I said, oh, um, well, that's the church I'm a pastor at. I don't recognize you. Uh, and, and, and she chatted a little bit and it turns out that she goes to VBS at that church. Yeah. And so her parents didn't have any connections to the church and, and are full aware of it, but in her mind, she goes once a summer, that's her church. And so you'd be surprised pastors out there, even the number, especially young people, but in the number of people who say, you know, I, I don't go to church, but I kind of know where I would go if I did. And, and you know what, that's a start. That's a start. Yeah, we've had that experience too. Um, you know, VBS is very popular everywhere, you know, I think. Um, but uh, these little kids, um, yeah, that they would say Trinity is their church. And it's like, well, your parents don't bring you or anything like that. But yeah, that they would, um, they've heard the gospel and you can see they love this place. Even if they just get to come mm-hmm. once a, you know, one week, once a year for a few years, and it, but they fall in love. Uh, with the gospel. They they do love it. We pray that their parents can hear the gospel too. We reach out to them too and want mm-hmm. them to fall in love with it too. But these kids really do love the church. Um, it's just sad that they're not being brought to the place that they love being. Yeah. You know, and I've had confirm, confirmands or catechumens rather over the years who would be like, 
you know, I want to come, but I, I, I can't, my parents don't bring me, I don't drive, you know, and you, you got to give them a break sometimes. But in any case, you know, the, the, the Thessalonians are out there. They've been resisting the evil one. They've been putting their confidence in the Lord. But as Paul brings up all these things, verse five, may the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Uh, I think Lutherans do a pretty good job, but I, I don't hear a lot in Christianity proclaiming Christ's faithfulness, Christ's steadfastness. Um, the idea that one of the things that Christ did for us is not just he came and died and rose again, which is, of course, the central and core of what he did for us, but he also doesn't abandon us, doesn't leave us. He gives us an example of what it looks like to both uh, meet resistance in the world and overcome it, but also to meet resistance in the world and in a way succumb to it, trusting in a greater plan. So, so there's a lot of Christians out there that I think get this idea that, well, if God's on my side, then anything I encounter in the world, of course, you know, they can't, they can't stand up to God. And yet then God allows some evil to befall them. And then it, it makes them, you know, lose their trust in God. But Christ is steadfast. His promises will come true. Um, even if, you know, in the meantime, of course, we struggle with, with sinlessness in the, in the world. I mean, sorry, <laughs> faithlessness in the world. Yeah. And the last week's text, again, if you're a three-year person in John's, uh, John 6, really did set forward. And, and there was an option in the Old Testament. But if you read the Joshua text, you know, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Far be it for us to forsake the Lord. You know, there was this call there. Are, are you going to remain faithful? Do you want to walk away as well? Um, the Lord, our, our Lord Jesus, remains steadfast, not just in the fallen world, but remains steadfast in God's promises. Um, because sometimes it's the promises of 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 God that cause us to to struggle. You know, not that He is the one causing us to struggle, but we struggle in them. Mm -hmm. Are are uh, are they true? Will He will He fulfill His word? And thankfully, uh, rejoicingly, uh, praise God in the midst of it, our Lord Jesus remains steadfast. That our our heavenly Father would keep His word, not just raise him from the dead, but would be with him. And that uh, his will is something that, that Jesus, the son should follow. And he did that always. Uh, every day of his life was a struggle against the evil one. We know about his temptation, but every day, every day was a struggle against Satan and all that would have him not go to the cross. Everyone that would have him give up on us. Uh, may we then not give up on him. Uh, because our Lord is faithful. Let's keep walking, following him in the midst of a, a crooked and evil and, and darkened generation that we live in. Um, yeah, there, there, is, there is a war that rages. There is a fight. Um, and it is against the evil one. He definitely does not want you to keep walking. He wants you to give up. There is this uh, understanding in the text of this despondency, this hopelessness, you know, that we could turn and become hopeless. And the, the encouragement of the text continues to be that you should remain um, filled with hope. And why? Because Christ is faithful. Not because, oh, you can do it. He doesn't say that. Right, he right. doesn't say, oh, no, just try a little harder. You, you got this, guys. He's like, no, mm -hmm. I got it. I got it. I've got you. So trust me. Just trust me. Yeah, regularly reflecting on how our lives are aligning with the scriptures and remaining committed to God's commands, that's living the Christian life. But above all, trusting that he really will, he really will sustain us. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to go to break here just a minute or so early. But when we come back, though, we're going to talk, we're, Paul's going to transition into what about the believers? What about those who have come to faith and yet are now walking in idleness and maybe even worse, not in accord with the traditions that Paul has set down. We're going to talk about what that means and a lot more on the other side of this break. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you on the other side.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back, friends, to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today, it's the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. We're going to head right back into the discussion, but I just want to point out that email address one more time, Thy Strong Word, all one word, of course, Thy Strong Word at kfuo.org. All right, brother, let's head back into the text because, you know, what I really find fascinating about this text is it kind of... <laughs> it, it kind of puts a quash on some of these ideas that the Christians were just sort of setting up this new kind of commune where everybody uh, would just kind of uh, pool everything together. And in some cases that it's sort of true because of the just the nature of what they were facing. But it doesn't mean that there wasn't the the need to work. <laughs> and I bring that up because. Um, I was on X, formerly Twitter, and, and a person posted, they said, it is an injustice that anybody has to work for food. And, and I, I just, I, I don't even know what to say to that. And of course, I didn't say anything because I'm not the type that goes around arguing on social media. But it, it, that, that seems like such a silly thing to say from any perspective. Um, it, it's, it's good and holy to work for our food. Um, well, at the very least, a consequence of sin, but it's good and holy for us to to uh, to 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 contribute to society. Yeah, and I would say that even work itself is not not the bad, right? Right, work, correct. Um, and and uh, and we were in agreement on this, and the scripture is. That it's the uh, it's the struggle that we have in work. That's the consequence of sin. You know the, that the uh, that the earth doesn't just plentifully build or, or produce and grow, but thorns and thistles. There's there's the reality of the fall that we would grumble in our work, and by the sweat of our brow we will eat bread. Um, but God gave us work to give us purpose and to give us even grace. And the work, look at the work that He gave to Adam at, in the. Uh, beginning portions or middle portions of uh, Genesis chapter two of naming the animals. And he gave them a, he gave them such an honor and yes, it is work, but it, our work in this world was intended to be a place of honor, a call into a position of, um, of honor and, uh, and, and place with God and his creating order. Right. And uh, so that we would turn to him and say, man, I have to work for my food. Um, isn't God working? <laughs> doesn't God work? Uh, God works. Uh, it doesn't hurt him. It doesn't exhaust him. Um, that's part of who we are to become exhausted. Uh, but uh, that we would be called into working um, to say that no one should have to work for to eat is right. an anti-God word. It's a, it is not from, that's not from the Lord. That we all should have to work. Um, yes. Again, we have the reality of the fall and there's struggle and those who just simply can't for uh, inability or um, all those things and the church should, should care for and all the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the vast majority of us, the 99.9% .9 of us, yeah, you should be doing work because it's, right. it's God given and it's God blessed to be able to use his gifts uh, and by so doing, he even gives us food. <laughs> None of it is ours. None of it is well, ours. Well, and that's, you know, and I think that's sort of the the point is that, first of all, even logistically, if you were like, well, listen, I, I just want to be given everything, it, it just, it's impossible because someone's labor has to then provide that for you. So on, yes. on its surface, it's kind of a silly statement. Um, right. But we, we kind of get the idea, though, people think, people recognize that out in the world, there are folks who are going without. And whether they can't work 
or won't work or whatever their circumstances is. We don't like to jump to conclusions, but at the same time, I, I guess I understand the compassion behind such a statement, but it really doesn't make a lot of logical sense. So I, I only bring that up to say that as we get into this text, this isn't, in my estimation, a text that's basically saying, well, you know, if if you uh, if if you if you don't contribute, you don't work, then you're not it's not worth preserving your life. You don't eat because that's <laughs> yeah. that's not what's happening here. I just want to say that in advance of reading it. Now sure. we'll read it and we'll break it apart. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, before be- oh, before you ahead. do. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't want to leave it. It's such a good point that what you're saying there about worth and value. Right. Because mm-hmm. if we take a look, you know, I always want to tell our kids and, and adults as we're going through the, the second table of the law. You know, if we focus in on worth and value, that that leads us all astray if the worth and value is solely on what this person can give to me and what I can produce. Um, that leads us all astray. But if the worth and value is intrinsic to what God has given to this person and what what Christ has given of himself for this person, then they have a worth and a value that I do want to feed them. There's no need. There's, there's no issue in God's creation that anyone should have to starve, right? There's not a scarcity in the world that someone could just be like, well, there's, we can only feed so many billion. Uh, sorry. No, there's right. no need. The world can produce enough if we're not greedy, if we're not unloving, uh, if we open our hearts um, and also to keep in mind, and if we work, <laughs> if right. we work um, for those who are willing and able to work. So, yeah, you know, whenever we're struggling with this, we always want to examine ourselves. What am I mad because I just don't think they have any worth or value? Or am I examining them? Am I looking at my neighbors simply on what they can do for me? Like that comment you made about uh, no one should have to work to eat because Mm-hmm. What about my neighbor? They they obviously their only worth is to work so that I can eat and don't have to work. Um, <laughs> right. So yeah, we always want to examine um, how I am looking at my neighbor and what worth and value do I assign to them. You know, and and I guess in terms of uh, eighth commandment, putting the best construction on it, I wonder if that person was just really tired and didn't want to go to work today, because <laughs> that happens too, <laughs> or that was struggling too. with some kind of picture they saw. I mean. Who yeah. doesn't just ball when you see, yeah. you know, a war torn area, when you see right. uh, uh, Ukraine, Gaza, China, uh, all the war torn areas in Africa and Sudan and and all the rest. And you see these little babies, you see these children and they're crying for food I'm like, oh, yeah, if I saw that and I would type online, no one should have to work for like we shouldn't have to. But it's not – I don't mean don't work. I just mean can right. we feed these poor children? Yeah. <laughs> it's hyperbolic. Yes. Well, yes, um, yes. And, but, but Paul here is not hyperbolic. In fact, he's no. very specific. And so I'm going to read now 6 through 10. Now we commend you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away mm-hmm. from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. (laughs) <laughs> and so there's the there's the highlight, right? That's what you put on the bumper sticker. But there's a lot more here. <laughs> there's a lot more. Yeah. Here. Now you got your uh, political uh, mantra, you know. Right. Um, yeah. And and even in the beginning, where it talks about being idle, it seems like we've allowed the definition of this word to be uh, directed by the context, which is not bad. I mean, that uh, should just should play a factor. But it's not just simply everybody sitting around doing nothing, but there is um, in certain other translations, the New King James, King James and others, they have it walk in walk uh, disorderly or with uh, being undisciplined. So it's not just being idle, but you're not walk. So imagine um, like the uh, parades of soldiers walking, right? They're walking, they're on the march, right? But what if one person is not walking in step? I mean, that's going to mess up everybody. It messes right. up everybody if you're not following along 
and and somebody is just going their own way. Everybody says uh, turn right and they turn left, you know, right face and they turn left. I mean, it messes up the whole the whole parade. It messes up the whole march. Um, and that's what's kind of happening here. We've got some disorderliness and it's coming from a um, someone not following the word that was preached about the gospel. So either they are idle because they're like, well, Jesus is coming back. Why am I, uh, why am I investing in my 401k? Right. And that's such a waste, right. right? Let's just use it up. Um, or they're so, uh, they heard a word from Paul that, be, you know, that when the Lord comes, let us be blameless before him. And they're like, I got no hope. Why even try? And he's like, oh, wait, wait, I got to correct all that in this letter here, right? <laughs> right. Uh, you're falling off the horse on either side, and, and that's not good. Uh, none of that is good. And we could call it idleness, but it seems to pigeonhole the message in one direction. You're just simply not working. And that, yes, that comes up later in the verses. But this mm. disorderliness, this undisciplined action, either on one side or the other, neither of that is good. We need to walk following Christ, our captain in the fight, our, our good shepherd, as he leads us forward, as we follow his example, he didn't. He wasn't lazy. He wasn't idle, nor was he hopeless. He was filled with hope. He knew that the Father would raise him. He wasn't despondent. He wasn't depressed in that sense, where he's just going to either stay in bed uh, because he didn't want to go to work or because he felt like there was no hope in caring for my neighbor or doing the work of an evangelist. No, he spread the word. And so does Paul, even though he faced hard opposition to the point where he had to run away from Thessalonica to go to Berea. And even there, they came from Thessalonica to there. Uh, he kept preaching the gospel because he believed that Jesus is coming. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe in 2000 years. But, it, but until he comes, we have work to do. Until he comes, we're living in God's grace. So what does God have us to do uh, today? Mm. I think you really are making some great points here because as you broke apart verse 6 for us, you remind us that we have to connect the walking in idleness to the – with the tradition that you've received from us. Um, it, it has this sense of kind of behaving wrongly, irresponsibly. So the, the idleness is really just kind of – you know, not really thinking that it's important to uh, what what what's being taught, what's being preached, uh, either as you explained, uh, an overwhelming sense that I, I'm just lost. Or maybe, you know, if if we knew Jesus for a fact was coming back on Friday, you know, would we show up to work? <laughs> mm. I mean, I mean, I probably would because I can't wait to tell everybody. But but, you know, right. if I if I worked for conglomero you know and they make are widgets. you going to the factory yeah yeah am i going to the factory no probably not um so so yeah you're right if they picked up that idea in their anticipation of christ's return means we don't have to do anything yeah they've absolutely missed the point uh kind of like that uh that dubiously attributed phrase to luther that says you know he would plant an apple tree if he knew the world would end tomorrow um I don't know that he actually ever said that, and I actually don't know if that's even good advice. But, you know, that's that's the sentiment here is that we we keep on doing what we're doing until the Lord returns because we don't know the day. It won't necessarily be a day that we can say, OK, it's going to come Friday. We, you know, we have signs, but we don't have dates. So, you know, keep on keeping on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, at some point, I mean, because it's true that we'll never know. And anyone who does say that they know, we know that they don't know. And that should be someone we don't listen to, besides just a general warning that we need to be ready. And we are ready because of the work that Christ has done, his faithfulness, and let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us come and receive the gifts of the Lord. Let's take up the cup of salvation and let us call on the name of the Lord. Um, it, this is the worship that he has given us. So um, if we... It, it, if we did know, is he coming up right? Yeah, he would say, go go to work because then you'd be showing that you actually believe my word, right? That we're going to give in marriage, be taken in marriage until the day, just like in the time of uh, of Noah. So, yeah, we're going to keep planting. We're going to keep sowing. We're going to keep doing until that day, until that day that he comes. 
So just, uh, it's almost, it's almost like, uh, I hate to say don't, um, well, yeah, don't worry about it. Cause worry is the wrong word anyways. Um, be, be, uh, expect, have a level of expectation, have a level of joy, have a level of, um, steadfastness because you actually believe, I mean, how many times, you know, with this, they're, they're saying, uh, that we believe that Jesus coming is coming any day. So why work in that sense of idleness? Um, why, why waste my time in, in the pursuits of this world? I'll just, um, have a pursuit of, of uh, prayer life or whatever. Uh, mm-hmm. and I don't need to take care of things. But um, if we did, if our age, if our age actually believed that Christ is coming back, I mean, man, that would, <laughs> that'd be great. I just wonder mm-hmm. how much um, our peoples don't, do they actually believe it? Because then would we get caught up in the other pursuits that we do? Um, mm-hmm. Get caught up thinking that these things are the most important thing. Um, and get worked up. It would remove all of our anxieties um, because this is not it. This is not all that there is to this life. This is just, it is gifts, uh, whatever you're doing in pursuits of, um, you know, whatever it is. I hate to single one thing out because then it makes it sound like I don't like it or this is bad. Right. None of these things, you can pursue whatever hobbies and interests um, and whatever activities and boards and committees in the church. But sometimes we get so worked up Um, But maybe it's because we've forgotten that Jesus is actually going to come and this world is passing away and that we will be raised up. So have no fear. Christ is faithful. um, And to turn ourselves to the love of God, God loves you. He does. And he'll keep his word. Well, even good things, right? I mean, so it's it's the sunk cost fallacy in a way, all right, sort of adjacent to that. And I'm going to explain. So, you know, for instance, we went to seminary. Um, uh, most pastors in the LCMS, uh, you know, usually have a, a four-year degree. And so then you go to the seminary for another four years in which you get a master's degree and you get to graduate. And, and so, of course, we're taught to love and proclaim that Christ is coming and we want him to come back. That's that's built into uh, the faith that God gives us, this desire to see Jesus. But after, you know, eight years and, you know, I'm a week away from graduating, it's kind of like, he could come back the day after graduation because I really want to check this box, <laughs> which is, you know, so that's a good thing that we're doing is adv- bettering ourselves, being educated, proclaiming the world. But you're like, that's a lot of work if, if Jesus is just going to come back. But then you're like, oh, wait a minute. That would be the most amazing thing ever. Who cares about this? <laughs> so, I yeah. mean, yeah, anybody can get caught up in that. But I, I do want to shift gears, though, because Paul does. I mean, he does talk, though, very explicitly about those who would, for lack of a better word, mooch off other people. You know, he says, we didn't eat anyone's bread without paying. We toiled with labor. And in fact, we have the right to do that. Or am I reading it wrong? How do you, how do you reckon seven, eight, and nine? Yeah, no, that's, uh, I would agree with that, that, um, that we are called to work diligently. We all have, um, a calling. We all have work to do um, as fathers and mothers, as sons and daughters. I mean, it, our kids have work to do at home. And if your kids don't have work to do at home, give them a job. <laughs> let, let them participate in the household in some way so they can see that they have responsibilities. And then they can be raised up knowing they have responsibilities. And when they go off into work and at home and church, that there's a responsibility that we have and that those are blessings. And when we try to, you know, push off all of our responsibilities, um, that is not, that's not good because then who, who's the only one we're caring for? And it's ourselves. All that we care for is ourself. And God is calling us to see more than ourself to see ourself in the life of our neighbor, to see Christ there. And and so in our love for Christ, we would care for our neighbor. And that means work. Yeah, there are things that we're going to have to do in a, in a fallen world that's difficult. Your back's going to hurt. Your, your knees are going to hurt. Your, you know, all these things. Um, there's stress. There's all the rest. Uh, but even in this, uh, God is active. He's actively forming you and conforming you into the image of Christ. Um, so when someone's like, no, nah, I don't need that. <laughs> no, nah, I don't want that. Well, then th- there is hard words here, right? That yes, the church should take care. I mean, we t- we do have people who literally can't work 
within our congregation and we should be diligent and care for them and look for ways to, you know, provide for, uh, um, electric bills and water bills and, and, and fall alongside of them and take them on drive, take them to the doctor and all the rest, which the congregation loves to do, right? Loves to do. Um, but most people, you know, uh, we will, we'll help you out with a gas card. We'll help you out with a little bit of money to get food today. But if you come back tomorrow, I'm going to say, uh, brother, you know, you're working really hard to get these handouts. I think you could work mm-hmm. just as hard to go get a job. In those situations, I often ask them, you know, how much do you need that would make a difference? You know, because if you're coming and saying, listen, I need to pay my back rent. I haven't paid rent in six months. If I give you a hundred dollars, it's not going to help you. Um, you know, we, we need to, that's where your lifestyle changes are important. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, and again, this is, you know, contingent upon there not being a, a, a serious issue that prevents them from working, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. I, I'm going to add verses 11 and 12 now, but I'm going to start with 10 for even when we were with you, he says, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat for we hear that some among you walk in idleness. Not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. I've looked at it in the Greek. I don't think it, this is a great turn of phrase in the English. I don't think it flows the same way in the Greek, but not busy at work, but busy bodies. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this this is a specific situation where people were not, were, I guess, just relying on other people to contribute for them when they could otherwise do so on their own. But yeah, even that phrase, to earn their own living, though, suggests that it's not about sort of providing money for the commune, but rather your own living. You know, per, you know, don't burden the church if you're able to work so that it frees up resources for those who really need help. I mean, don't you have that in the book of Acts and, and then in – is it the pastoral epistles to where it's, you know, we can enroll these people, you know, if you're, if you're a widow, well, that's one thing, but how old are you? <laughs> and like, and there's like this thought of, you know, it'd be better for you to be married. You know, it's better for you to do this instead of maybe at a certain age, you're just going to go around to house to house. And, and here it's talking about being busy bodies, you know, maybe you're just going to spread some uh, discord or, or the rest you get news and you take it from one house to the next and, and the rest like that. And that's not building up the church either. So why don't you just go, go to work. (laughs) If you're going to be busy anyways, might as well use your hands for some kind of good. Um, So I think there is just, I, when I hear that, I see, I see the church living itself out and through the book of acts and some of the realities of um, pastoral epistles um, where, it's just some good, um, some good wisdom of how the the church should be in concord and unity together, uh, and not let for disunity uh, and strife to enter in. This idea that he is commanding and encouraging, but commanding, really points out that. This is a big deal. This isn't like, well, hey, listen, I have a suggestion. You know, your, your lives are at stake. Uh, picking up then with verse 13, uh, as for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. But then verse 15, which brings us back to the top of the show, do not regard him as an enemy but warn him as a brother. So I I think that's fascinating too. You know, you're warning him as a brother by taking note of him and having nothing to do with him and shaming him. I mean, that's, (laughs) that's interesting, right? That's an interesting approach. Yeah. Yeah. My, my wife is a preschool teacher. I hope she forgives me for sharing a a word, but you know, it's the first days of preschool, right? And uh, the kids come in, she's got little, little, little ones. And they're, you know, they start off really kind of babyish and they turn into these little, little big kids, right? By the end of the year and they can do everything and they're, they're ready to go off to the next, 
to the next year. But here they're kind of whining and they got the baby voice and they're, uh, you know, complaining that they don't have the right color crayon. And, and she just will tell them, you know, um, we use a, we're big kids now. We're big boys. We're big girls. We use big boy voices. And she said that a few times to the point where the, all the other, when some other, a couple of kids were still doing it by the end of the day and all the kids go, we're big boys and great girls here. And we use big boy voices. So what they heard from their teacher, they then repeated. And so it's this command or this proclamation, the, the, the Greek word there is this proclamation that we have heard from the Lord. Now we are proclaiming it to you that this is the teaching. It is a command because it's the word of the Lord. And now we heard it and now we have been conformed by that word and now we're proclaiming it to you. And there is a bit of shame in it in the sense that, mm-hmm. no, we don't act that way. And it wouldn't it be great for the whole congregation when someone is just walking in a disordered life to be like, uh, brother, you need to get back into this is right. look up you're this is a mess. Um, let's get you back here. And that shame of being having to be called out by the brother, it doesn't have to be pastor, it could just be their own family saying, Brother, sister, this ain't right. And the whole congregation being like, We don't we don't talk in baby voices anymore because we're <laughs> we're we are children of God. Uh, we have been grown up. We have we're no longer using milk. So yeah, it's uh, it's a strong word, but it comes from the sense of love and wanting to gain back our brother, Matthew eighteen. That's right, and that's the key. Warn him as a brother, gain him back. You know, for his sake, we turn him over to Satan so they can see that. Yep, we're the much better option. Um, at, you know, the Lord has called you to a much better life than what you're living. Well, Paul ends this letter in these three verses that I somehow expected to talk about for an hour yesterday, tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Um, Just real briefly as we wrap up the show, um, Paul's writing with his own hand. Earlier he talked about fake letters going around, which was kind of fascinating. Um, Tell us a little bit about what we think is going on here. So you'd have a writer. uh, So uh, Paul would dictate the letter off and then send it off. But here at the end to make sure that they knew it was him, he's writing in his own hand, not just dictating it, not just speaking and some scribe is writing it down in the end. He takes up the pen himself. Obviously, there's always speculation. Doesn't mean he has bad uh, penmanship or the rest. But if you're going to use someone professional, I'm sure they write pretty professionally. I have my secretary take a look at my letters uh, before <laughs> they go out to make sure it sounds professional. I'm not uh, misspelling or have a you know missed uh, comma or something. Um, so uh, here in Paul's own hand, they can see it. Um, and what can they see? And it's a, a blessing that he speaks a blessing and, and any good letter is seen as a, a, a sermon. And here he concludes the sermon that the Lord of peace himself give you peace. And that's what we need. That's what we need in this fallen world where we can feel despondent and without hope or feel like, well, what's the point? Uh, I just don't, I don't want to even try. I'm not going to put myself out there, but we have a peace in Christ because he is the Lord of peace. So no matter what you're faced with, the God of peace is with you by his word and in his gifts. And if you don't feel that peace, you don't sense that peace, well, then be where he is. Come to church, receive his gifts, receive his word proclaimed to you, be in study together, be with and in the encouragement of the brothers and sisters in Christ uh, so that you may know uh, the love of God for you in the communion of saints. We have this body of Christ that comes together. Uh, So God's peace be with you always. Amen. Amen. All right, well, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend John Shank, pastor of Trinity Lutheran Church in Edwardsville, Illinois. Thanks again, brother. Thank you. Tomorrow, Pastor Thomas Eckstein comes on the program with a surprise topic still to be determined. He'll be just as surprised as you are. And then Thursday, we'll get back into the Old Testament with the prophet Amos. Pastor Jacob Heine will be here to help us with that. But until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all. As we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.